Hello, everyone, and welcome into CrushTheStreet.com. I'm Kenneth Amaduri. And uh, one thing I would say is that, you know, we've really been pounding the table here on the dynamics of the economy and the midterms with my guests lately. And honestly, it's just, is it just the news of the week or the midterms? Or will this story continue to move forward? Are, are we in for a significant stock market correction? Are the fundamentals too great for uh, any president, any you know, leader to overcome? And I'd like to talk about this today, the turbulence in the markets. I mean, gold's up pretty significantly right now. Uh, let's talk today with Jerry Robinson. He's a returning guest here at Crush the Street. He's an economist, a veteran trend trader. So that's important to us here, a serial entrepreneur. So he understands people. He understands uh, the market emotions. He's a best-selling author. He's the founder of followthemoney.com. And you might remember him from FTM Daily. That's his former website. Now it's followthemoney.com. Uh, Jerry, thanks for coming on Crush the Street with me today. Sure, Kenneth. Great to be here. Thank you. Jerry, uh, let's talk about this. I mean, some of the things I, I said there in the introduction, um, you know, what's your thoughts on the current environment, the current economic environment? The current economic environment? I think that uh, the current economic environment is um, extremely dangerous. I believe that it's been that way for a long time, but we've had a lot of Band-Aids that cover up the real underlying issues that are going to have to be faced at some point by some administration, by some people uh, in the future. And uh, so far, uh, the lack of character within our leaders, the lack of foresight, the lack of wisdom that has been displayed by our leaders has simply been uh, astonishing. And this leaves our economy in a precarious state. Our, our economy is facing serious issues as we go forward. Although there is a lot uh, to point at, uh, if you are positive about the economy, I guess you could point to some of the recent job figures here in the United States. You could point to the fact that uh, the latest GDP figures here in the United States quarterly anyway, were 3.5% uh, preceded by a four point something plus uh, the, the quarter before. There's a few things, I guess, that you could point at and suggest that somehow the economy is doing okay in the near term, but that does not do anything to solve the longer term issues. And I'm sure your, your listeners are familiar with the longer term issues facing the economy. I wrote a book called Bankruptcy of Our Nation. It was released back in 2008, 2009. At the time, Kenneth, uh, the idea of saying bankruptcy of America or bankruptcy of the United States, the publisher wouldn't allow that to happen. Uh, it's so it's so interesting how we've evolved over time. So when I published that book, or whenever the publisher published the book back in 2009, bankruptcy of our nation was as risque as the publishing world wanted to get when it came to talking about America's long-term financial crises. Now today, you could put out a book called Bankruptcy of America, I'm sure, and no publisher would would mind. But you can see how far we've come in our cognizance of where we are in the economy. And so if you're asking me about the current economic conditions, you know, I would say that we have an unbelievable amount of debt that's facing the United States. We have deficits that are historic. We have, of course, the national debt, which is absolutely outrageous. These, it's an immoral time. It's, it's immoral what is happening to the future. Uh, we are sucking the blood out of the earth, oil, at, a, at an astonishing rate. We are using up the resources of this earth as if there is no next generation or a generation after that. So economically, I think we are in an immoral situation. Our monetary system is debt-based. It's based in, on, upon usury, which is, you know, from all faith perspectives, going back 
for hundreds of years, usury has been considered to be evil or something that should be avoided. Thanks to situational ethics, we have found ways to make usury just fine. And we've been able to make it even religiously fine. Hmm. Uh, So Christians who considered usury a mortal sin for the first 1,500 years of the faith suddenly decide that usury doesn't mean what it actually means. And so now, you know, they're all in as well. So we really have no brake pedal anymore, uh, Kenneth. There is no brake pedal. Even the, even the faith traditions are fine to drive us off the cliff because they're, they, have, they, they have become ignorant of the underlying issues facing our economy. So there is no brake pedal anymore. We are going off the cliff. Yeah, no, that's powerful. And, you know, much, much of the audience is very libertarian minded. And, you know, the, the famous libertarian line is taxation is theft. And it's so difficult to explain that just to the average person, because we're just so used to that. And, you know, even us as libertarians, we just accept a certain degree of that just because that's how things are. And, you know, it, it is what it is. I can't live in a hole and, and be upset about this every single day of my life. But I mean, from a fundamental basis, absolutely. I mean, I, I agree with you 100%. So let's talk about the dynamic that you said. You said we have seen some Band-Aids here on the U.S. And that's very interesting to me. And I feel like the U.S. is doing this at the expense of other nations. And maybe it's just com- competitive because now, for instance, Trump has lowered the, the tax rate. And this is now bringing back capital that was overseas that would otherwise benefit another nation. Now, this now benefits the U.S. to a certain degree. And in many instances, we saw nations around the world in unison, you know, inflate their own currency, you know, central banks buying their their currency, and, and you have ultra low interest rates. So this all happened at the same time when the U.S. might have been able to just kind of go off on his own and many other countries decouple from it, everyone kind of followed suit. So can you give us any understanding on what's happening on a global basis and you know how much of these band-aids are sucking the, the standard of living the wealth from other countries and benefiting us here in the U.S.? It's funny when you go back throughout history, you'll discover that, that Asia has long been the prize of the West. There's a really fantastic book uh, by Peter Frankopin called uh, Silk Roads. It's a fantastic history I would recommend people check out uh, of basically the West trying to dominate Asia. It's always been kind of the, the thing of the West. And in fact, Asia for a long time has been the reigning uh, economic power. If you go back for the last 2,000 years, you'll find that the majority of time Countries like India and China, because of their population center, because it was so large, they simply dominated the global economy. As far as GDP or whatever metric you want to use, you'll find that Asia has long been the large economic power. And it's only really been since the age of discovery, you know, 1492 Columbus and, uh, you know, and others who uh, have who really kind of brought us into this new age where the West is, you know, um, the power, the the power center uh, economically. And Asia has made some bad moves uh, over the last few centuries. And now we're starting to see that heal. And we're seeing the rise of Asia now. We see the rise of China. And and we believe that the rise of China and the rise of India uh, is not going to be a straight line up but it's an inevitable lineup and the fact that they are certainly moving higher. And so the United States has recognized this late, but they have recognized it. For many decades, the United States was giving uh, aid money to China, uh, believing a different story than what was actually going on. It's only recently that the United States has woken up from that uh, stupor and decided that it, it really has to take China seriously. So the pivot to Asia, so to speak, back uh, whenever President Barack Obama pivoted, finally, after spending decades of uh, squandering wealth, treasure, and blood in the Middle East, they suddenly decide we need to go conquer Asia because China otherwise is going to take control of their own backyard. And that's, of course, an anthema to the United States empire 
who doesn't want nations like China to control the, the China Sea, right? That's what the United States is supposed to do. We control the sea lanes. And so this is a very expensive empire that we're running. It makes it very difficult for it to remain sustainable in the long run. And so when President Trump speaks about the grievances to the American people and he says, you know, we have seen China take advantage uh, of us. Well, that's exactly true. Uh, it is true that other nations have taken advantage of the United States. But what Trump doesn't, uh, he doesn't point out is the fact that the United States has been taking advantage of these same nations for a very, very, very long time. It's the same thing that we look at when we see the migrant caravan coming for the border, the southern border of the United States. Here is this country that was basically carved up and taken at gunpoint from a people, right, by immigrants, you know, from Europe. And suddenly the, the woe in America is, oh, no, immigrants are coming to take our land. It's almost as if we don't know where we are. Do we, do we forget where this country is? We, we forget what America is. Do we not forget how it was created, how it was formed? It was formed at the at the uh, at gunpoint. You know, it was it was raw. It, we robbed it from the from the uh, inhabitants that were here before. So, what do we expect to happen in America? Do we think that that cycle won't repeat again? It's exactly what's happening. So, we have immigrants now coming towards the United States, and if you want to say that they're threatening, or if you want to say they're non-threatening, that's up to you. But the point is, is that it's not surprising that the same cycles of history are playing out over and over again. It's not surprising to see the Chinese empire rising because they're no stranger to empire historically. It's no surprise to see the United States being taken advantage of, considering that it takes advantage of other, other countries. It's not surprising to see immigrants wanting to come to America, uh, even illegally if necessary, as it was created through illegal immigration. I mean, so you can go through and, and, and look at all of the problems, but what you find is, is that it's simply a circular thing that's occurring. History is repeating itself, and there's nothing new under the sun. So it, as, as far as the solutions that we've seen from President Trump, you know, he has certainly targeted a rising China, but unfortunately what he's doing is, is he's trying to shoot a rising China in the backside. He's, behind, he's one step behind. America is one step behind China. Uh, China has, has uh, certainly, I believe, uh, carved out itself a very nice path through its One Belt, One Road initiative, uh, through its checkbook, checkbook diplomacy. It's handling its, its allies and even its adversaries, I think, in a much uh, more calculated and smarter way than the United States, who actually shoots at its allies and uh, certainly is making less friends as we go along. So I see China winning uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this battle long term, and I see the United States uh, unfortunately making a lot of terrible chess moves, if this thing could be equated to a chess game, making very terrible chess moves here, shooting at our allies and not recognizing the signs of the times. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and so how, how does this play into trend trading? Um, is, does any of this play into the way you see the markets and the, the way you're positioning your investments? Because I mean, that's really the scoreboard in a certain way. I mean, you know, we, we have all these ideas of, of what is going on in our politics and what people are doing, what they're likely to do, what governments are likely to do, um, what's likely to happen based on previous historic imbalances. You know, how does this play with, you know, where you're positioning your money and how you expect it to go on in the future? So uh, just, just for example, the most recent uh, implosion we saw in the stock market over the last month or so where, where we saw tech stocks get hammered, we saw a general sell-off in the market across the board. Uh, according to some metrics, you know, worst, uh, the worst uh, sell-off we've seen on a monthly basis since back in the 2008 crash, uh, this was a great month for us. It was a great month for our members because as trend traders, uh, we don't have any conviction at all whatsoever when it comes to the market. We're not, uh, we don't believe anything. Uh, we, have, we come to it with no beliefs at all whatsoever. We are agnostic towards the market. If the market is rising and it has support 
then we use that support to, to ride the trend. Uh, if, the, if the trend begins to go down, then we use the resistance as an area for a stop loss and we begin to short. And so we were able to take advantage of this massive uh, sell-off we've seen over the last uh, several weeks uh, by alerting our members, our paid members, you know, premium members to what we were doing. And so we were shorting this market using 3X inverse ETFs, uh, specifically on the NASDAQ, also on emerging markets, also on the Dow. And some of our members were shorting semiconductors as well. I mean, we, we were really shorting the market. And then we, then we suddenly turned uh, bullish just a couple of days ago and gave our members that same uh, alert. And we told them that the market looks oversold here. It looks like we have found an area of support. And so therefore, let's go in long. And we've been right now for a few days. And, but, we, but we simply let the market tell us uh, what it's wanting to do. The market is really just a reflection of expectations. It's really nothing more than that. It's certainly not the economy. The stock market it has nothing to do uh, you know, with uh, telling us what the economy is saying. It's really more about expectations of earnings and expectations uh, of other things. But it's a, uh, and so it's for, for trend traders, I think this is a, the kind of environment you look for. You look for an, an environment where you have uh, you know, lots of movement, but we would generally prefer a more stable trend. And so for the last several years, trend trading has been wonderful because the market has been in a long-term uptrend and it's, it still is, by the way, according to our metrics. And so the bias is still to the upside until we break down below more resistance or uh, support levels. And so, you know, trend trading, I think, is a great way to be uh, viewing this market um, with the portion of money that you want to trade. Uh, if you are, you know, of course, there's always that portion of money where you're just buying and holding for the long term. You know, we're always looking, you know, I was just talking to somebody recently about, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, many people bought Walmart way back in the, in the 1970s, you know, because they saw the writing on the wall. They saw Sam Walton. They said, this guy knows what he's doing. And so they began investing in his company. And sure enough, if you had held that for 30 years, then you're going to beat the snot out of a, you know, out of a trend trader who's just trying to make money that week. I mean, so you do have your long-term money that you're looking for. And I think in this environment, Kenneth, the two areas that we really gravitate towards, I mean, our Walmart moment, if, you know, here we are in 2018, let's say you're talking to a 30 or a 25 or a 35 year old who's saying, man, where do I stuff money for 30 years? Where do I put it? Where, where's the Walmart stock that I should be investing in? Well, you need to talk to a trusted financial advisor, of course, but from our perspective, uh, we like two areas in particular. We think over the next 30 years, uh, uh, two areas that we absolutely positively think will excel over that time frame are cryptocurrencies, which we have been long on since 2012, uh, when we started first buying Bitcoin and telling our members to buy Bitcoin, and then also uh, uh, cannabis, the cannabis uh, stocks. So cannabis and cryptos to, to us for the next 30 years, uh, your grandkids will not believe that you had the opportunity, uh, in my opinion, to buy some of these names in the crypto space and also in the cannabis space for the prices that we see today. They're not going to, they simply would not believe that you had access to it. And sadly, because we get so wrapped up in the micro and we get so wrapped up in the day to day and the news cycle, the 24 seven news cycle, oftentimes we don't have the the patience to think out that long. But when it comes to those kinds of investments, that's what we're looking at. But when it comes to trend trading, you know, you just kind of follow the pulse of the market. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I, we've covered cryptocurrency here at Crush the Street and we've been pounding the table very hard in, at the cannabis space. And, you know, you don't have the, the anheuser Bushes yet or the Constellation brands of the cannabis space yet. You know, these stocks that you would otherwise, you know, put your money in as almost like a safe haven, like an Anheuser-Busch, you know, oh, it's going to be around in 200 years, for instance. And, and uh, that hasn't even been fully defined yet. That means the, the growth and the opportunity and the dividend paying stocks have yet to, to really emerge. But obviously, the growth side of that, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. We're going to look back and go, I can't believe, you know, we could have seen some of these names and, and had the opportunity to buy them here in 2017 or 2018 uh, and then- and that's, and that's, let me add something to that, Kenneth, because that's very important. 
for the person who is saying, you know, I want to have these core holdings for 30 years, I, I want to have some things that I think are going to go up dramatically over that time. Well, what you do is you look for moments like today, uh, where we have uh, cannabis stocks getting pretty big, you know, pretty hit after the legalization in Canada, kind of the, a lot of people sold on that news. And we've seen a lot of cannabis stocks come down. We have a cannabis report on our website and go to follow the money.com and you can see all the different reports we have. We have one on cannabis where we share our favorite cannabis stocks and then also cryptos, you know, which are currently uh, uh, very depressed price wise, relatively speaking. And they're also demonstrating very little volatility. So they're in that zone where they may end up breaking out or breaking down from here. But it's in moments like this where there's a lot of blood in the streets that you take those positions for the longer term. Um, and so, so while we may, we may, you know, as traders, we may say, oh, you know, we should buy it this week and then maybe it doesn't make money the next week and we, we throw our hands in the air. But from a longer term perspective, you know, this is the kind of environment that you're looking for to, to make those, uh, to take those positions in these uh, kind of industries. 100% agreed. Well, I'd love to get your thoughts here on gold. We've seen gold come up uh, pretty significantly today. I mean, we're at 1230. It's not a very exciting price considering, you know, where we were, what, seven, eight years ago. Uh, you know, $1,900 gold, but we have come up and, you know, I'd like to get your thoughts here on the trend. What are we seeing? Obviously it's up from its low that we saw in 2015. We've never gone back to that low. Uh, and, you know, we kind of have these quick spike ups to 1350 or so, and then it seems to just teeter off from there. And, you know, here we are again at, at 1230. So uh, what are your thoughts on gold at the moment? Is this something you're bullish on long-term? I, yes, uh, long term, of course, because of the debt based currencies that we have, the fiat based currencies, which, you know, uh, the United States government is borrowing more now than it ever has. Uh, the same people who are barking about how bad spending was underneath the Bar uh, President Barack Obama's uh, presidency have suddenly gone silent. Hey, Kenneth. Have you seen any uh, Tea Party types complaining about the national debt or the deficits lately? I don't think so. <laughs> they tend to only care about that whenever their party is not in power. And the fact is, is that I'm long-term gold because I know that the amount of debt in the system is going to crash the system. I know that. I mean, it's just a matter of time. It's, a, it's literally mathematics. And so, so gold is a way to hedge against that. But in the near term right now, this is one of those moments, again, for people who don't have a, a core gold position, this is the perfect time. Or for those who do, this is a good time to be, in my, in my personal opinion, I'm not giving advice, but in my own personal opinion, as I look at the chart, this is a time where you begin consolidating or add to your current positions. The key area we're watching on the gold chart is the price, 1238. Uh, 1238 is where we found support uh, many, many, many months ago and rallied off. Since that time, we broke below 1238 and that's been a really key area of resistance. We just rose up to 1238 in October earlier this month and we got bat down right back again. And as you mentioned, we're about 1230. We haven't seen gold break out even in this big equity sell-off because I don't think this equity sell-off is uh, and I could be wrong, but I don't think, it doesn't look like to me, having been through, you know, I've been trading for 20 years. So I, I traded through the dot-com bubble. I got my, cut my teeth on the dot-com bubble. And then uh, the, I traded through the 2008 crash, called that one, of course, that was our claim to fame. But, but, but as we look at what's happening now, this doesn't look like a, the beginning of a, of a major uh, collapse of the stock market. This looks like a really logical pullback because the stock market, as we mentioned, is a reflection of expectations. And right now, uh, again, I despise bringing politics into this conversation, but literally we have the midterms we can't ignore. They're, they're next Tuesday. And the stock market is very smart. Obviously, it's a reflection of, of expectations. And it's expecting the Democrats to take the House. Uh, it's also, there's a slight little potential that the Democrats could also take the Senate. It's a very small possibility, but it could happen. And the stock market doesn't like uncertainty. So up until this point, both uh, the Republicans have controlled all, part, all, all houses. They've controlled the Senate, the Senate, the House, and the White House. 
And uh, there's, there's a fear in the market that that's going to change. And if the Democrats do take over the House, that means that they have the power to launch committees. And they could get Trump bogged down in a whole bunch of, you know, uh, of uh, investigations. And that to the stock market is not good news. That's not, that's not the kind of news that they want to hear. Uh, they want certainty. And so I think the stock market is pricing in a Democratic victory of the House. I don't think it's pricing in a Democratic victory of the Senate. Therefore, on Tuesday, uh, if we have, and this is what we're telling our members, I'm not going to give you the exact thing, but we're, tell, we're, we're going to give our members an option strategy going right into Tuesday because there's a very big possibility that if, if the, uh, uh, the Democrats don't take the Senate, if they just take the House, then it's very possible that we could see this market rebound because then it's all kind of, it's all kind of known at that point. They may not be really excited, but it'll all be known. If we have this blue wave that some are hoping for uh, and we see actually the Democrats take both the House and the Senate, I think you could then see the stock market hurdle even lower. And then, there's, of course, there's one more uh, uh, option, and that is the Democrats don't take anything. And if the Democrats don't take anything and if, if the Republicans main, can maintain control across the board, then I think you could see a lot of conviction buying as people realize that the status quo is going to remain intact. That status quo may not be great, but at least it's certain. And I think you would see this kind of jittery stock market rally on that news. So I think a lot hinges upon Tuesday, the, the uh, midterms. And I think a lot of what we've seen in the sell-off is directly related to the price of equities readjusting in a logical manner to this new uncertainty uh, that may be uh, arising. So um, it, but let me just finally bring that back to gold now, because gold, um, that's why I don't think we saw gold break out too much in this sell-off, because it was a logical sell-off. It wasn't a panic sell-off. It was a logical sell-off. And so gold is just kind of still churning. Uh, we do believe it's going to run eventually. We own gold. We have a core position in gold. We have a core position in silver. And we're long-term uh, believers in uh, hard assets. But in this environment, it's just a good place to accumulate. There is no long-term trend. There is no even a position trend on the weekly chart. This thing is completely uh, in a downtrend still. And 1238 is the very first area of resistance that we want to see violated before we even become at all slightly excited about the current trend in gold. Well, uh, that's a powerful thing, and, and that's a reason to definitely visit your website prior to uh, the election here when we'll be sure to get this interview out uh, sooner rather than later. That way it's not old news by the time uh, we have this election. Uh, but if people want to learn more about what you do, um, please remind everyone about the website and maybe just a little bit more. I mean, I think people got a good idea of, of the service you provide, but anything else that you'd like to add for people to uh, visit you and what they can expect to find? Sure. Yeah, I'm a former financial advisor. Uh, I'm an economist by trade, studied economics at the university level, and then did a lot of economic consulting with different businesses and, and whatnot over the years. In 2010, uh, I started followthemoney.com, which you called FTM Daily. It used to be called FTM Daily. Uh, it took me forever to buy followthemoney.com. Somebody was squatting on that domain and I couldn't get it, but I finally got it. And so followthemoney.com is our website. And uh, there people can come and they can become a free member. We have a bronze membership. We have bronze, silver, gold, and platinum, right? We love the precious metals. And so, so bronze is a free membership. And there you can come and you can get access to our market tracker where we tell you what the current trend of the stock market is. It's very helpful for people who have 401ks or IRAs and they like to kind of adjust their, their buying and selling based upon the current market trend. Uh, so that's really nice. We have a free podcast we put out on a regular basis. We interview some of the top minds in the economic space. And on top of that, we have, we have premium memberships. So if you're, maybe you're looking for a new trading idea every single day delivered to your inbox or by text, you know, one of, the, one of the latest trading ideas we're spotting. Or maybe you want access to our cryptocurrency portfolio with alerts on when we buy or when we sell. Or maybe you want to see which cannabis stocks we like and which ones we're going to be buying or which ones we're going to be selling. Or maybe you want access to our trend trading software. We've actually created a trend trading software where you can type in any stock or any crypto or any currency or any commodity and instantly see, is it in a long-term uptrend or is it in a long-term downtrend? And then you can, you know, 
basically take a lot, what a lot of our members do, uh, Kenneth, is they subscribe to many of these other newsletters that put out stock ideas. And then they use follow the money in our, in our trend trading software to type in those stocks and see, is it time to buy or is it still in a, mired in a downtrend? And they wait for the momentum to begin on that stock before they add. So, so we end up being a really great place to turn to when you're looking for ideal entries and exits on your, on your stocks or ETFs or whatever you're trading. But we provide so much education. We have a live Tuesday and Friday uh, coaching call that we do with, with our members. And so we give you, during the market hours, we're here to provide help and you can ask questions. So we have so many services. The best, place, best thing to do is just go to followthemoney.com and uh, just become a free bronze member to start out. And then from there, you can decide which, which membership is best for you. Jerry Robinson, everyone. Jerry, thanks for coming on Crush the Street and sharing your insight with us and, and just taking the time with me today. Absolutely. It's my pleasure, Kenneth.